And thanks for joining us for this um, for these power hours of insights. So as Paula mentioned, my name is Natalie and I'm the Creative Development Director at Cantar and I work very closely with a lot of clients taking concepts from very early stage development right through the process into finished film. I absolutely am not creative, I'm not agency, but I work very closely with agencies and we largely use the we largely use the consumer insights to try and guide us through that process as closely as possible. And we've learned so much through the years and it's been guided by a lot of the neuro stuff that we've done as well. So where possible, I will give you as much insight as I can and, and tell you a little bit about what we're experiencing at the moment. So <clears throat> let's see if this is going to work. Just give me a shout if it doesn't work, please, Paula. Sure. All right. Great. So. Great. All, all working. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> the, um, the 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 creative argument that that we've got going on at the moment is is incredible. So, I think you know if you're a brand and you're starting out, one of the first things that you'll want is some form of saliency for your for your brand. And there's two ways that you can do it. The one is you can spend your heart out behind a campaign. And the other way to do it, which I think is underestimated, is that you can have exceptional quality creative within the process. And it's important to note that that creative quality that you've got explains your saliency growth by 50%. And then if you synergize the different media points, you can get almost an additional 10%. And I think this is an important point because often what I hear agencies saying is, um, or at the moment is is clients are pulling their media <clears throat> and it's terrifying for me because if your clients are going through their line items and pulling media one of the things that we should be thinking about is surely you should be pulling things that don't get you a return on your investment and media absolutely gets you a return on your investment and shouldn't be considered as something that you should pull from your line items especially if you're getting a return but fundamentally you will not get a return on your investment if your creative quality is weak. And sometimes I hear marketers saying to me, well, our last campaign didn't work particularly well and because our media wasn't particularly, our media planning wasn't strong or we didn't reach what we, want, what we needed. And I will ask and I will say, well, how do you know that it wasn't the creative? And they will say, no, it wasn't the creative and that's because all of Exco approved this, uh, this concept that we had. And there, there is nothing more dangerous right now, especially right now, than having your exco approve the content that's going out because South Africans have changed. They're going through a lot and we need to know and stay in touch with what it is that they're experiencing and we need to, we need to sort of, we, we've got to be on top of it. So yeah, so consider that when, you, when you're moving stuff out of your line items, make sure that, that you're moving the right things out of that, the, the line items as opposed to the wrong things. Then I think when it comes to what we're seeing at the moment, if you were looking for any argument for, for where media is at the moment, you can very clearly see that TV and video type content viewership has increased over the last month. So this is um, from our survey, our Cantor Barometer. If you haven't um, seen any of this data yet, uh, we'll send it around to everyone on the call. Because you can see that people are claiming to have watched significantly more TV than they have in the last month. And these numbers are rising with each wave that we're doing. This is the hot off the press data that Paula was talking about, which we got yesterday. And TV, on-demand video streaming is up and online videos, all of these data points are up. So, it's, so if, you're, if you're wondering if you should be pulling media and you're wondering where eyeballs are at right now, it's in these, sort of, in these, media, in these media places and these mediums. And we've got to, make, we, we've got to, to notice these sorts of things. Um, socializing using digital platforms is the new way to connect with each other you can see whatsapp claimed whatsapp usage is up tremendously as is facebook instagram TikTok. all of these digital platforms are up and the other one which i've heard quite a few times over the last month or so is that there is is the suspicion that radio listenership is down but we see a lot of um our consumers saying actually no and you, and we have to remember that listenership in cars is actually a small portion of radio listenership so we're seeing increased usage of radio listenership and the reason is is because people are turning to the more trusted forms of mediums 
that are out there is they have learned pretty quickly that it's hard to differentiate between fake news and real news. Um, even for even for the, the more educated people, that, um, we're falling into the traps of, of what fake news really is. And I'm sure many of you can attest to that. So, so just remember the sort of balance that we've got here. So we've got clients moving media spend out of their, their line items. Yet we've got increased viewership. So we've got the perfect space to be speaking about our brands. Um, and the, I think the challenge though, the, and what clients are finding themselves feeling right now is they actually don't know what to say. So if you ask consumers if they want to hear from brands, they absolutely do. So you've got 1.5% of South Africans who say, yeah, brands should stop advertising right now. So actually what we find is people want to hear from you. They want to hear from some of these brands. But there's this very, very big tightrope which says that 78% of them are saying that you should not be using this as a situation to exploit or promote your brand. And this is the tough tightrope. So what's happening is brands are preferring not to say anything as opposed to speaking to, to the consumers. And that's quite risky because if you think of your, cust your customer base as, as real fans of yours, um, you've got to be in a position to talk to them and you have to talk to them through what they're, what they're experiencing right now. Um, because what they're experiencing, I'm afraid, is something that's quite different. The, the consumers that you thought you knew have changed their behaviors in the last month or so. The ones that you have segmented your entire business on, that you have created models and profiles against, are all changing their behaviors extremely rapidly. And it's tough because you know, you've, got to, you've got to now adjust very quickly based on, on what it is. And the reason that they're changing their behaviors is largely based on the level of concern that they've got for this COVID. So I just wanted to point out um, something quite funny that I saw in the data. So if you can see this, it's quite a busy chart, but these are people who say, this situation concerns me hugely. So that's the COVID situation. And we're looking at the difference between wave one and wave two, which is mid-March to end March. And if you take a, a cast your eye down to where you see South Africa, our first wave was eight, um, 74 and it's now at 82. You can see actually that we've been quite concerned about COVID almost the whole time. If you compare that to the likes of the UK, who was sitting at 59 and now are at 82, they're suddenly up to the levels that we're at. And then if you look at the USA, middle of the chart there, it's 58 to 79. It just shows you that South Africans their level of concern has been at high levels almost from the start. And I thought that this was interesting because I thought this points to how South Africans are. They do tend to worry a lot. Um, and, um, and this despite, by the way, at the time, I think South Africa, this wave, had had 18 deaths in, in South Africa, whereas USA were in the thousand, I think 14,000, and, and at the time, UK was at 8,000 when we did this. Um, um, and it just shows you that South Africans, regardless of the situation, were concerned. So I, I sort of started to dig around in the data. And what we realized is actually that South Africans were not that concerned about falling sick themselves. They were actually far more concerned about the financial implications and the demands that this was going to put onto the family in terms of the financials um, post-COVID. And that is still playing out very strongly in the data and is, is, um, is very much so still the trend across the globe as well. I think the, the thing that you've got to remember that, that's driving the behavior changes, which I'll talk about in a second, um, is that if all the behavior changes are being driven by this primary negative emotion, which is fear, and if you've heard me talk about primary negative emotions before, you will know that they are sadness, anger, disgust, and fear. And if you are going to start your communication and you're going to reinforce any of these primary negative emotions, you've got to be very careful because what you're doing is you're reinforcing what the nation is being gripped by right now, which is this, this concept of fear. And it's just a shout out just to be careful of, of, of that within your content. So what does fear do? If you, if you think, think of the physical manifestation of fear, it raises your cortisol levels, your heart rate starts to increase, and some of you will start responding differently. Some people are eating more, some people are sleeping more. We'll talk about that in a second. But the fear, particularly for women, 
fear is quite a big thing. So women have far higher levels of cortisol and they respond far more quickly to fearful situations, but it also limits their ability to listen. So if you're creating content in this area of fear or fear mongering, just be careful because there's a chance that you start to shut down some of the senses that the South African woman particularly um, is feeling. And um, so some of the behavior changes that we're seeing are, are great. Um, we see uh, 38% of people that are, are trying to eat healthier, 32% saying I'm trying new recipes, 12% um, say I care less about my diet now, 23% treating themselves more than before, and 30% snacking more during the day. So that's me, I'm in that 30% there. But these are lovely insights into behavior changes that are going on right now. So if you could take something like, if you know, if you're a food brand, for example, and you know that 32% are trying new recipes, I would strongly urge you to consider your brand and how you could place it into different recipes right now. And we'll speak about that in a second. Um, let's just talk about a few more of the fun behaviors. So 53% are focusing on personal development. So here you see that people are, pa are, are panicking or processing panic in different ways. 50% are reading more. So again, if you're in any of these, if your brands are in any of these sorts of areas, take these insights and see what it is that you can use um, and try and dig deeper and try and understand more about the, the insight behind it. 31% um, making an effort to connect with others more now than ever before. And 17% are working more. And as I was saying to Paula yesterday, I feel like some, some of us on this call are definitely the ones that are, feel like we're working hard or never worked harder. I think if you work for an agency right now, I bet you're feeling a bit of burnout from the amount of work that's going on at the moment. And then these are my people. These are the guys who are, there's 22% of our smokers who are smoking more. I'm not a smoker myself, but um, I suspect that's going to go down when uh, the, the price of cigarettes at 120 rand a box <laughs> becomes unbearable for some. 33% um, are avoiding alcohol. And as I said before, I'm not in the 33%. Um, I, I was the one at risk of running out, um, running out of alcohol or running out of wine. Um, but anyway, so they're, they're, they're avoiding alcohol and then 50% and then are sleeping more and sleeping um, more potentially because they're drinking more, I said. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so consider all of these behavior changes. And I just wanted to quote Stuart Walsh from, from Gray. He's the chief strategy officer. Then he said, for once, I would urge you to think small right now. <clears throat> think about how you can make people feel. And feeling right now is probably the most important thing that I can talk to you about. It's about making people feel more comfortable, less lonely, more at ease. The feeling is what you've got to remember because what they are feeling right now is fear. And you've got to consider how you can create something around fear. But your brand has to genuinely and authentically address that. Because I think the biggest criticism that we've seen has been how can you use your brand to take advantage of this situation? Don't do that. You can't be seen to do that. At the same time, continue talking to your people because you don't want them to be left out there. So, so here's some, some sneaky insights. So there's this lady who, who on Twitter said, I bloody love Jamie Oliver's keep cooking and carry on because he says you can substitute ingredients for ones that you have in the cupboard. And I made his aubergine curry dal with herby flatbreads tonight. And you can see that it's, it's baked beans on toast. And <clears throat> as I was saying to some of my clients, if your brand has been stockpiled right now, you have to consider the long-term implications that come with overconsumption of your brand. If you say, for example, grew up on a farm with guavas or mangoes and you overconsumed, the chances are now you don't eat those because it brings back a historical or a legacy memory. And what you've got to be careful of right now is that you don't want your brand to be as associated with any negative long-term associations that come with I ate too many of whatever and it reminds me of that time that we were all in lockdown and so if there's a way to get around that um, and and then you take that idea or the behavior that people are are um, creating different recipes or trying out new recipes and here's where you can create um, magical things with what's in your fridge. I, I cannot remember the brand. Someone on this call, I'm sure, will rem remember it. I have a feeling it was Hellman's Mayonnaise who got chefs involved and said, "What? Give me four ingredients from your 
from your fridge and then they created this amazing dish out of whatever was in the fridge it was either I feel like it was Marmite or Hellman's I can't remember someone will have to keep me honest on that one but next I think it won it can um, <clears throat> an exceptional example of how you get people to engage more with different products and, and get your brand into different dishes at this current time some other tips that we've come across so some of the copy that we've seen <clears throat> is is a small shout out to any of the copywriters on the on the call is is if you if you're speaking about don't do something versus remember to do something so let me give you an example so if you go to the grocery store and you go don't forget rubbish bags don't forget rubbish bags don't forget rubbish bags you know how you do that in your head and then you arrive home and what have you forgotten rubbish bags and <clears throat> there's a reason what happens in your brain is that your brain is trained to remove the negative prefix from from before the whatever you're asking it to do so it starts to remove the don't so, so rather, rather use the word remember to do something, remember the, the rubbish bags, which is an interesting concept. Um, so you can imagine what happened when the country said, don't panic buy. Everyone started to panic buy. And the, there's more reasons to it. The, the other reason to it is because if you so much as threaten the female's fundamental role, which is to continue the existence of our species, first of all, and secondly, to protect her, her, her clan, um, if you suggest that and you, you associate don't with a negative verb like panic, um, what it does is it absolutely will create panic. Um, so, so consider the ways in which you can kick off your content. We've also seen that by the way for years. So if you start an advert with a negative start for you and you ask a negative question, my, my classic is what's for dinner mom? Um, because it's like a question that creates a stress for, for women. And it's like, um, those are the sorts of things you got to, you think about, or um, do you have, neg do you have um, dry skin or something? You start off on this like very sort of active, hardcore, um, start and it sometimes can create um, it doesn't entice people in as easily as we'd like so just thinking through all the negative words that go into copy at the moment <clears throat> is one of the things we we've seen another one is just if your brand is involved in high human emotion or sensorial experiences then plan your party because when the new normal arrives which hopefully will happen um, your brand needs to be present so you know, behavioral science has taught us that if you can't have something, you're going to want it, which is exactly what's happened over the last month. So we've been told we're not allowed to walk outside our houses. We're not allowed to do, you name it. We've been told we're not allowed so many things. And, and never before have you wanted to go for a run with your dog more than you have in the last month. Um, this sensorial shutdown or the experience of, of being with your family or having family meals, all of the senses that you're stunting right now, are, are going to need to be reignited and use those senses within your, within your copy. I'm sure you've heard me say before that when we test copy, the most powerful scenes are the scenes that demonstrate some form of sensorial response. So whether it's tasting of the food or hugging or anything that is a sensorial aspect, those are the moments that, that people respond to very favorably and will probably more so now than ever before. Um, Although it's quite risky, isn't it? Because you've got this dilemma of let's not let's not go against what what government has told us to do. Um, so so we've got to trade carefully because government's told us not you know to demonstrate no signs of large gatherings and and no weak hygiene habits and no sharing of food etc. You know licking of fingers. So these all these things that we've been told that we shouldn't be doing. And in situations like this. We're looking carefully at the advertising and, and we're trying to make sure that we're not offending what government has told us to do. At the same time, you can't destroy the storytelling within the adverts. You've got to be so careful of, of what, we're, what it is that we're saying. And then also, we, this is where we start mining our bank of assets. You know, if you've got assets that have worked hard for you in the past, consider airing them again. I'm assuming obviously your jobs to be done are much the same, although I suspect most jobs to be done have started changing lately. Um, but consider if it has worked for you hard before and it shows a more a, a sort of a stronger sense of of what um, of, of government's rules and regulations at the moment, and consider consider going backwards. <clears throat> um, I think the other thing, just a small note, um, is that we've also seen things like word of mouth working really hard for for brands at the moment um 
And word of mouth is not just word of mouth. It's not just between you and I and the conversation that we have. People draw word of mouth from, from many sources. And influencers are one of them. And you will see brands that have been, Nike is, is a good example, who have used the rugby players to try and get the message out, to get government messages out. Um, use the South African rugby players. And there's many that have used influencers positively. As long as it's done authentically, it's a very good way to get that word of mouth up, as well as radio um, presenters. So I've said that, you know, what happens is when you, when you listen to a radio presenter every morning, in your mind, you set up this sort of relationship with this person, despite the fact that they don't know you, in your mind, you create trust with that person. And so when you hear a radio presenter talking through a live read or, a, or, or whatever it is that they're doing, it holds a lot of credibility and, and people are looking to credible sources, as I mentioned earlier. So consider some of those things in terms of the word of mouth aspect um, that, that we're looking for at the moment, especially, um, especially now. And then, yeah, so some of the things that people are asking for help with, so or what they're asking for is, if you look at it, so they're just saying, just be practical. You know, just we need help in everyday life. And one of the things we saw an increase in was just just be an example and guide this change for us as brands. You you know you need to step up and lead as opposed to sitting down and keeping quiet, which is what many are doing, I'm afraid. Um so just practical help, um, using your knowledge to help explain and inform us, um, help us reduce our anxiety levels. And those those are some of the pieces of feedback that we've seen from our customers one of the points that we got is that actually we don't need you to be funny right now and this was so interesting for me because you will know that we've humor is by far the biggest driver in south africa for advertising content or success of advertising content should i say assuming your brand is is designed for humor and um what we what we saw is is despite this we see a whole lot of people going actually it's not it's not the time to be humorous at the same time south africans will still want to have a laugh we have seen some fantastic responses from brands like savannah who have helped um stand-up comedians do online um comedy in in wonderful approaches same as the hunters lockdown party there's wonderful brands that are taking the insight of that consumers need to connect right now or they need a little bit of a break and their brands are sort of taking the step back and they're putting the people over the profit or the insight over the profit and they're trying to help in that way and i think it's wonderful <clears throat> i think if you're a brand that can't sell anything right now you must know that advertising will sell for you so if you can't sell right now the one way to to attack this is to wholeheartedly use purpose because we know that purposeful content is not necessarily designed to sell, but it's there to create those long-term memories. Um, and sometimes we forget that. <clears throat> yes, I'm just going to talk through one example. We tried yesterday to get it to play and it won't play, but I'll, I'll, I'll just talk you through it. Um, it's a lovely example by Facebook. And it starts out as most COVID adverts have. If you've, if you've, I'm sure you've seen that, uh, that, COVID advertising is all sort of taking on the same sort of approach where you see these empty streets and empty buses and tube stations, etc. And it starts out in much the same way, but the very big difference between this Facebook um, COVID support advert is that it uses voiceover extremely powerfully, as well as music. And I'll give you the link to it. It's going to be in this in this presentation. Um, and actually, if, you, if you're on YouTube, just go and look for you. We're never lost if we can find each other because that's the Facebook COVID support. Lovely example. <clears throat> and it proceeds to, to use this powerful voiceover. It's written by a lady, a British performer called Kate. Um, <clears throat> I always forget it. Kate Tempest, I think. And, and she sort of rhymes or, or raps through this. And it's, it's extremely powerful. Um, where the advert takes a change, though, is that you start seeing all these empty bus stations and streets, etc. And then it moves into actual visuals of human faces. And this is where you start to create an emotional connection with people. And people, when people see people crying, you as a human being are designed to mimic 
what is going on within the advert and see if you can watch this advert without crying, I dare you. Um, it, it's definitely designed to give you a bit of a drizz. Um, and then it turns it into these sort of more happy and powerful pictures of people connecting, as you have seen, beautiful shots of like this granny who's obviously clearly meeting her little granddaughter for the first time through a car. And it's like these very emotionally powerful um, scenes, um, all the while talking about um, how there's so much peace to be found in people's faces and how she loves people's faces. And... Um, and then it goes on to say that we're never lost if we can find each other. And then it says if you can, if you if you need help or you can offer help, and um, then get in touch with the, the Facebook COVID support um, page. And it's designed it's designed specifically for that. I I think it's a very powerful piece of communication. And this is about the difference, the meaningful difference that that content needs to be creating right now. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, so those are just, oh, the other thing just, yeah, to, to remember is that when it comes to branding right now, so the other thing I've seen a lot of in the last month is, is weekly or poorly branded content that's going out. And, and there's, a, there's a fine line because you want your brand to be associated with what it is that you're doing or your efforts out there. At the same time, it should be about the message and not the brand. So just a small caution there. So if you, if you consider what your most memorable moment is within the advert, that's the part that people will walk away with and they'll remember. Try and see if your brand can be interlaced into that most memorable moment. And I'm afraid putting a logo in the top corner of your advert does not provide strong brand linkage. We've seen that's been proven over and over again. And the reason is quite simple. The brain, if there's a strong story going on within the advert, the brain will actually see that logo in the top corner and it will profile it out because it'll be a distraction to the storytelling that's going on. So yeah, something to consider in terms of brand linkage within your content. So yeah, so those are some of our top thoughts on creative that's going on out there right now. Um, Hopefully you could hear it and see it. Um, great. Paula. Thanks. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah. That was fantastic. Um, really great to keep it. So um, you had a lot of information, but we really appreciate you keeping it really short and succinct with some great takeaways. And I think, um, you know, I'd like to pull out a few things and then just remind the audience um, while you're on mute, if there, there is a private chat and you can share your questions. I'd also like to ask you while um, I kick off with some, some questions with Natalie, um, if you have any examples that your agency or company has done or seen, especially from a local point of view, um, advertising or marketing or customer experiences, um, regardless of where they fit into the marketing ecosystem, if you've seen something that works, um, I'd love for you to pop me a note on the chat and then we can, we can have a chat about that because I think it's about looking at who is doing a great job and seeing how that can work, work for our various, um, you know, our customer experiences. Um, so Natalie, um, the first thing I wanted to say, I guess, is that it looks like a lot of standard best practice is, is coming through. So just like anything, even at a time of crisis, the good hardworking points always come through, um, which for me at the moment here looks like, you know, really understand your customer probably more so than ever before, um, understanding those cha key changes in their behavior, um, deriving those smart insights, and then segmenting. I mean, I think we can see you know, and I'll be interested as we move forward with these sessions, as the phases unfold, you know, how that behavior changes and how segmenting um, to personalize and ensure we're saying the right things and getting the right message to the right people. Um, I think segmenting and obviously understanding your data and, and how to utilize that across the different touch points will become more important. And then, you know, you've, you know, throughout your presentation, you speak to emotional empathy. So um, just really as a brand, or an agency working with a brand or even with the local publishers or wherever one's choosing to work with trusted, um, you know, um, platforms, um, you know, just that emotional empathy and, and paying yeah. attention to those, like, um, um, let me just grab his name here, uh, Stuart Walsh, you know, Stuart. Said about, about the small things. Um, yeah. and he also um, actually, a small side point is, is Stuart actually said, he said at the start of this thing, he said to me, just so you know where you heard it, I'm predicting um, empathy overload or, or empathy wear out. Um, and, and it's true. I mean, you saw it immediately with almost every brand starting their content with, we, you know, 
um, we're in this together and you, you've seen all the cliched things about um, never before have brands been more available, you know, um, in it with me. Um, and it's true. And, and there's this fine line between the sort of authentic empathy versus fake empathy. And, and where I, it's, it's, it's sort of weird, but where I've, I've given more credit, personal credit in my mind to brands that are not shouting loudly about the efforts that they're putting out there and brands that are creating, turn their factories into um, uh, sort of hand sanitizing at mass and they haven't said a word to anyone and they're just reading it for free. And those are, those are beautiful stories. Um, and those create a strong point for me. So, so certainly for me personally, um, but yeah, you, you've got to shout about some of those, that good effort, Absolutely. I'm afraid. And yeah. I think sometimes, you know, um, perhaps and certainly some of the brands I've been speaking to, you know, one looks at, you know, the, you want to do something big, you want to do something meaningful. But, you know, when we talk about the small things. If you look at your customer experience, right, from an email signature that someone might receive as part of your communication, I've seen yeah. some really great ones. Um, yes. I saw Mark one, one of our members, even just a simple line that links to more information to help educate. It's not their role. It's not their job, but just a really easy way to show that your brand is on top of it. Your brand is looking at it and looking for those, those small wins. Um, um, Christopher Africa um, is an AI company. Um, we work with Michelle and she shared a story and I wanted to share the idea. Maybe some of the audience can take it on board, but it just so happens that her husband's a chef and what they did was they got their 23 of their clients on, on a zoom webinar um and they delivered um that stage they'd moved into the right um phase i think where they'd ordered i think on one of the platforms they'd ordered delivery home delivery of food parcels so that they could then all cook together online and i just think you know as the phases move i suppose one will start to look at reaching out a bit more to customers yeah. Um, I don't know if you've seen any sort of other great moments from your clients where they've tried to do something to connect in that space or an, an advert that you feel has, has lent itself to, to this moment well? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, so I mentioned earlier, and I, I do think it's a good example of, um, of understanding what consumers need right now. And that's a Savannah, Savannah stand-up comedy platform that was created is just that's that's exceptional and I think that was very hard work um, and and just solved so many needs solved needs for the stand-up comedians solved needs for consumers out there who need to connect it was authentic in line with the brand's um, proposition and what it stands for and um, so that's obviously the one example um, right. um, geez you know when you've seen so many examples um, and then to think of one on the spot, what's another good example? Um, the Hunter's House Party. Oh, and the Safari Live Drives, another one, like brilliant. Just getting getting people into a game drive, you know, in the morning. Yes. And, and yes, it's virtual, but geez, that also clever. So thinking long, that's a long-term thought. Um, and creating desire for what it is that they're doing. Lovely examples there. Um, seeing artists like Jeremy Loops, performing in his lounge for people just you know those are just okay. understanding that people want to connect they still want music they want to see faces i think um, that's um something that i've certainly seen um my husband works for puma and they do these um home sessions now um and yes, to see the dj yes. yeah the dj in their own home environment you're getting a real sense even for influencers of what's yeah. on their bookshelf um it's a really nice insight so i think for any mm. brand advocates or brands um that work with you know people who represent their brands to, to bring those spaces into your world, just bring such a, a new level of authenticity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, you know, you mentioned some brands, you know, just wanting to stop, cease advertising spend. You know, you've mentioned mm -hmm. two points that were quite nice, I think for short term ones. And the one was looking at what I already have. Um, so I almost don't have to spend any more money or spend very little yeah. money to, to leverage them. So you mentioned your bank of assets and yeah. potentially a trusted radio voice over or a trusted yeah. voice that, you know, can play into those, those, those pictures. So I think that's a really great one. I think your other one, you know, if you are going to spend, so if you've got a little bit of money and you want to spend it, spend it wisely on platforms, you know, with, with trusted sources, because I think everyone's looking for that trusted connection. Yeah. Um, we've certainly seen at the IAB that I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it'll be in the latest narrative report, but I think month, in the last month, there's been a 45% increase of readership on local plat online platforms. Um, yeah. yet the spend's dropping. So I think that's another key area 
Um, it just with, doesn't make sense. Yeah. yeah so I just doesn't at, tie up. Yeah. yeah. And, and looking to spend, um, and looking to spend, um, you know, time with those trusted resources and love the radio, you know, the radio and influencer piece. Um, yeah, yeah. Those are really great insights. Um, well, that's great. I think that was really all from me. Um, and I don't see any questions. I don't know if anyone wants to do a last shout out. Um, I see, uh, see one here. I don't know if um, this is from um, Danilo from Special Effects Media, who we work with on the IOB Insight sessions. Um, sorry, Danilo, um, I'm not going to unmute you just yet. <laughs> but um, there was a question here. And um, Danilo said, just said, thank you so much. You covered everything so brilliantly. Great insights. Um, did you see anything in YouTube consumption specifically? So we've seen, you know, he's seen TikTok or video on demand is up, but is there any, any insight around uh, YouTube consumption? YouTube consumption. Um, so I think that just the specific channel of YouTube went on into our last wave and that I suspect is going to be released on Friday. What's today? Wednesday. So what I'll do is I'll take the details down of, right. um, did you say Danilo? Danilo, yeah. And I will, and I will, once that report's released, I will send through uh, the specific detail on YouTube. Um, but a, a, um, so now I'm totally going to misquote this, but if I remember, I did catch a glance of it and I seem to think that it was 60% up. So people were saying, I'm watching 60% more YouTube than I was last month. It was somewhere around there. Please do not quote me. I'm probably wrong, but it was somewhere around there because I do remember taking specific note of it. Um, but yeah, it is, it's going, it, it's certainly up. Yeah. Along with the on-demand and, and all the rest of it. So people are turning to, to the video, the video content. Yeah. Well, hopefully um, someone will catch on to all of us moms who are homeschooling and, and try, oh. friends who can try and help us out. <laughs> yes, exactly. Somehow. And I suspect Need that. help. It's yeah. a, call, a call for help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually, a, that's a good point. We should cut that data by moms or, or you know, people who have kids in the household. And I suspect you'll find it's vastly different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thanks, yeah. Natalie. I don't know if there's anything else um, you'd like to add in closing. Otherwise, I'll just say, share some information about our next week's session before everyone jumps off and starts their, yeah. their day. Or no, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, in closing, <clears throat> please feel free to reach out and have conversations with us about what kind of content is working at the moment. We've actually, we, we've done a whole lot of parallel tests. So we've tested a whole bunch of adverts before COVID and during COVID to work out that people are responding in much the same way, believe it or not. So, you know, don't worry about testing an advert now and thinking that everything has changed. Yes, people's perception has changed, but it's it's more about how you're saying it. Um, so, so reach out and touch base with us. There's ways to test things in very quick, um, agile ways. Um, that don't take a lot of time. So yeah, cool. Great. That Thank would be you. All I have to say. Awesome. Thanks so much, Natalie. Good. No um, problem. So we'll share this presentation um, with a thank you emailer that will go out to everyone who attended um, and a link to, to the video if, you, if you'd like to share this um, webinar with your colleagues. Um, there is a, from what I understand, Natalie, there is a larger deck um, that you worked on with Fran Lucan from, from Gray with a few more creative pieces and yep. I think um, Kanta are happy to share that we'll put that on our IB member portal just as added value for for our amazing members um, and then next week we have Stina van Royen. Stina van Royen, um, my daughter's looking for a cat, wonderful. Um, <laughs> Stina, <laughs> so close, we almost made it. Yeah. Uh, Stina van Royen from Kanta will be sharing um, more data from from the third wave of data specifically around brands looking ahead at what's coming um, and, and how we navigate that, how we navigate that together as an industry. So that link and um, RSVP will go out um, today. So thanks so much. Thanks to everyone for joining. And, and Natalie, thank you to you and the team at Kantar a &E for uh, making yep. it possible. Not at all. We'll My see, pleasure. You guys, see you next week. Stay safe. Thanks Stay everyone. Cool. Bye. Cheers. Bye.